Now we're going to keep building on the terminology related to fiscal policy. Fiscal policy conducted by government, two tools of fiscal policy makers, government spending, or taxes. Now, let's explore a little bit more about government spending. A thing that I've seen students struggle with in the past is the idea that if government does it, good or service, it must be a public good. And I think that stems from the term public sector. The public sector implies that it's something being done by government. But for our description of a public good, that's not necessarily a match. The term public sector and public good, these are overlapping terms, but they're not identical terms. From an economics point of view, a good is a public good when it meets two qualifications. It's non-rival and it's non-excludable. To be non-rival means one's use of it does not diminish another. Things that are rivalrous are things that we get frustrated with when we see other people doing it. Traffic, congestion, that's a form of rivalry. Public goods don't have that. They aren't really subject to that. To be non-excludable means anyone can access it. Anyone can use it. It's open to everyone, legally and in terms of accessibility. So the one pure public good is national defense. It does come from the public sector. But think about why it's non-rival and non-excludable. If the military is defending you or me, or you and me, it's, it's not setting anyone else back who is also being defended by the military. It, there's no congestion there. There's no waiting in traffic to be defended by the military. Um, another example of uh, rivalrousness is something we see at like a park. At a park, uh, you see the grass potentially get worn down. You have bare spots where a lot of people walk. The playground equipment or the benches can be worn out. People drop trash and cigarette butts and stuff like that. Those are examples of rivalrousness. As some are using it, the use by others is diminished because it just gets worn out. National defense, the pure public good, it's just not like that. It's also non-excludable because even though there are people who maybe are opposed to the military, they're still protected by the military. The military has no means to exclude somebody from national defense. We're all protected by it, simply by the nature of sort of being within the country's borders. Now, you could make the argument that a U.S. citizen outside of the U.S. could potentially be excluded. Uh, I suppose that's a stretch, but generally... An American citizen is not excluded from national defense. So it's a, it's a public good. Uh, then there are other kinds of goods that I'll touch on briefly because we had a whole chapter on this. I mentioned parks. Parks aren't really a public good. They're called a common resource because they are rival. One's use is diminished by another. Anyone can use a park. Notice who provides parks. Typically government. So it's from the public sector but it's not a public good because of that nature of um, rivalrousness, because the ability of more people using it to wear it out. So it fits in a category we call common resources. A similar category, some textbooks call both common resources and this category I'm about to describe, quasi-public or quasi-private or near public and things like this. Um, uh, the book I prefer calls it uh, club goods or a natural, uh, or a, yeah, monop a natural monopoly. Um, but these are goods that are excludable, but non-rival. One's use of it isn't being, isn't diminishing anyone else's use of it, but people can be kept from using it. So an easy go-to example, because this is a review, uh, of something like this is the bridge over the Susquehanna River, the I-95 bridge over the Susquehanna River. It's seldom at the bridge gets traffic. There's plenty of traffic south of there and occasionally traffic north of there, but 
In the area of the bridge itself, unlike a lot of our bridges in the state of Maryland, it really doesn't get congestion. If it did, it would be rival. But it really doesn't, not by my experience. But it has a toll on it. So if you stop paying the toll, don't pay the toll, eventually it's going to catch up with you. So it's excludable. That fits in this category of club goods. Who provides it, though? It's the interstate highway, so it's provided by the federal government. Public sector provides the service. But it's excludable. You have to pay to use that bridge. So, again, the terms are overlapping but not identical. And just for by way of review, the final category of types of goods from economists' point of view is a private good. And private goods are both rival and excludable. My favorite example of a private good is my hamburger. Because my hamburger, if you take it, there will be consequences. I'll get you, and I might be able to get away with it, because you're not allowed to do that, because it's private property. We have private property it's rights established to the things that are ours. So it's excludable. But it's also a rival, because if I turn my hand outside and you jam your finger down through my hamburger, my use of it will be diminished. So it's also a rival. So that's a private good. But that's all review and hopefully just a little bit of fun. So, as we're talking about public sector provisions of goods and services, the point here, the big picture, is that these not need necessarily fit our category of public goods. National defense is one. And now things start to get political. Because as we increase government spending on national defense, some people have very strong feelings about that. That may not, they might not approve of that as being our best way to, uh, to increase government spending. They might argue that the government should be increasing spending by subsidizing the productions of, production of things like satellite dishes and windmills. Both of these are government spending. They tend to fall along political lines of which one people favor. And why would we favor these at all? What is the point of this discussion about government spending? Why am I talking about it? Well, there are two kinds of uh, fiscal policy actions. Expansionary and contractionary. Increasing spending by government, whichever of those two sources of spending I just described are, they're both expansionary fiscal policy. And so we might say, I favor this, we might say I favor that. But then there's another approach. Rather than choosing between this or that, we might say, what if we just cut taxes and we let all the households who would benefit from that, from having more of their income in their pockets, why don't we let them choose where to spend their money? That's also expansionary fiscal policy, cutting taxes is expansionary fiscal policy. So we can increase government spending, then we have a trade-off in how to increase government spending, or we could decrease taxes and we could pass that trade-off onto the households. But which taxes? Because we could also decrease business taxes and let firms determine how to use that added revenue or added profit uh, rather than make a decision in how the government might allocate spending. So, a couple of things here. The two tools of the fiscal policy maker are taxes and spending. The two ways they may use those tools, the things that they might be trying to accomplish, are expansionary or contractionary fiscal policy. Expansionary policy is designed to expand the economy. Contractionary fiscal policy is actually designed to shrink the economy, and I spend very little time exploring that beyond what I'm about to do here. See, fiscal policy makers in the United States are elected officials. And elected officials like a couple things. They like re-election, and they like moving up to higher-ranked offices. Those are usually statewide offices or longer-term offices. Uh, so contractionary fiscal policy is something that they theoretically can engage in. I just don't expect, because people respond to incentives, that they will do that very likely, very often. But that's also why we have this other category of policy, which we're going to get to later, called monetary policy. Monetary policies are distinct from government and not subject to the influences of elections or are lesser subject to the influences of elections, I should say. And so we keep them separate and autonomous from government precisely so they can bring about contractionary policy when it's necessary.
but that's for a later date. So let me try to set up a little uh, matrix here to clarify some things around fiscal policy and to define yet a couple more terms. I've said we have expansionary fiscal policy. versus contractionary fiscal policy. And we have two tools that the policymakers might use. They have taxes at their disposal, because they can raise or lower taxes, and they have capital G government spending at their disposal. And I'm grabbing that capital G from the national income identity, which is that the output of the economy is equal to C plus I, plus G plus an X. Did I tell you to memorize that? I know I did. I know I did. It's always going to come back our way. So fiscal policymakers, if they're engaged in contractionary fiscal policy, what would they want to do with taxes? If you want to shrink the economy and you're a fiscal policymaker, how do you do it? You increase taxes. What if you want to expand the economy? When would you want to expand the economy? All the time, if you're an elected official, but particularly when might you want to expand the economy? When times are bad, right? When businesses are closed, perhaps for a virus or something like that. So what might you do with taxes to expand the economy? You decrease taxes. Or what you can do to expand the economy is increase government spending. If you wanted to shrink the economy related to government spending, you could decrease government spending. So these are the tools of the fiscal policymaker and what they would do with regard to those aims. Now, this leads us to a couple other important terms related to budgets. Because let's think about the relationship between taxes and government spending. You see, taxes generate tax revenue. Government spending is over here. That's an abbreviation. And these are separate things, at least in the short run. They can determine how much to spend, or they can determine how much to raise in taxes, uh, tax revenue through the tax rates. Well, what happens when government spending exceeds tax revenue? They spend more than they bring in. How does that feel? Feels kind of icky, probably. How does it feel if you spend more than you bring in? Or if I spend more than I bring in. Do you like the way it feels? No. That leads to what's called a budget deficit. That's spending more than we bring in. Now, I want to point something out. This is a flow. Spending, a verb, an action. Bringing in, a verb, an action. If we have deficit spending in a year, the next year, what will we have? Debt. We will owe what we didn't bring in of what we spent. So deficit leads to debt. I want to point that out because the United States government has deficit spent every year but about one since sometime in like the 60s. So the debt, the federal debt that we I know everyone has heard about, has been increasing since then, with the exception of one year, where we actually had a reverse of these things, and the government brought in more than they spent. So I'm going to just change this inequality. And in 1999, or uh, fiscal year 2000, thereabouts, tax revenue exceeded tax uh, the government spending. So that leads to a budget surplus. Did it do away with the debt? No, because that had been built up for years and years and years before that. 
that just provided fiscal policymakers with some means to pay down the debt if they wanted to, or they could decrease taxes and go uh, and, and just let the debt ride. So a surplus doesn't diminish the debt by much. It just has to happen many, many times to do away with the debt. Each time we deficit spend, we contribute more to the debt. I want to point that out because surpluses and deficits affect the debt, but the debt is this outstanding thing. It is the result of prior deficits um, and can be reduced by prior surpluses or could have been reduced by prior surpluses, but they're not the same thing. So in our lifetime or in my lifetime, there has been a good year where we did not have deficit spending, but we certainly still had federal debt. Now, that leads me to uh, a concluding point on this video about governments. You see, there are different kinds of governments. There are different ways to be G in C plus I plus G plus NX. When I'm referring to the government, what I'm referring to is the federal government. But that's not the only government that makes up government spending. We also have 50 states and some other territories that make up government spending. States or commonwealths. Pennsylvania and I think Virginia are commonwealths. For our purposes, they're states. There are also local governments. In Maryland, we have 23 counties and a city that is its own local government that has fiscal policy uh, impacts. They can choose how much to spend or they can choose tax rates. So they affect fiscal policy. They have fiscal policy makers at each of the municipal governments in the state of Maryland. Just so you know, across the United States, just as a rule of thumb, I don't know the exact number, there are about 3,000 counties or local governments that contribute to government spending. Now, not measured by macroeconomics and government spending, but something I like to think about is also uh, HOAs. I just like to think about them and encourage students to think about them because they uh, are something you might want to think about in your personal decision making. See, a home, HOA is a homeowners association. I'm member, a member of a homeowners association, and I get to vote for who represents me in the homeowners association, much like I get to vote at the local, state, and federal level for who represents me at those levels. The homeowners association can assess fees, just like taxes. They can even assess fines, just like any other government. And they can set rules and regulations upon me because I volunteered to do that by, by living in the um, townhome association or the townhome jurisdiction that I live in. I think it often gets overlooked or not thought about because it's precisely so easy to vote with your feet. That's an important figure of speech, vote with your feet. If you don't like your HOA, selling your home and moving to another home within the same county isn't that hard. I mean, relative to leaving the federal jurisdiction, it isn't that hard. Uh, it's an option to vote with your feet, and hopefully I'm illustrating the meaning of that term, vote with your feet. If you don't like it, you can move. As you move up in these other forms of government, that's a little harder for an individual or a household to do. So these three are all measured in government spending. Now, over here, we're talking about deficits and surpluses. Most local governments are not allowed to run deficits by their county charters. States, all but I think two states, are banned by their state constitutions from running deficits. They have what are called balanced budget amendments in the state constitutions. The state of Maryland has a balanced budget amendment. How each state enforces that or measures what that is, is respective of that state. The federal government does not have a balanced budget amendment, and most economists generally kind of prefer it that way believe it or not, even though it leads to debt. Here is why. When, at what kinds of time, would we want to engage in expansionary fiscal policy? When would we want to see expansionary fiscal policy happen in particular? What would things be like when we say, okay, let's do that? Whether it's spending on national defense, or whether it's subsidizing the production of uh, solar panels or windmills, 
or even whether it's even when it's cutting taxes. At what periods of time do we look to fiscal policymakers to engage in expansionary fiscal policy? I'll tell you the answer is periods of time like this, when the economy is not doing so well. How do we know when, what are our measurements for when an economy is not doing so well? Unemployment is high or output is low. Those things go together. The federal government's primary source of revenue is income taxes. When unemployment is high, what does that mean about income tax revenue? It's off. It's down because there are fewer people with jobs. So let's go back to this, uh, this red rectangle. If there were a balanced budget amendment, that would mean that the federal government would be required to have these be equal. For these to be equal, if the economy is shrinking, that means tax revenue is falling. What must they do with government spending? Well, for this to remain equal, if this is falling, this must fall. Expansionary fiscal policy is increasing government spending. That arrow is contractionary. Do we want the federal government to engage in contractionary fiscal policy precisely when the economy is doing badly? When people are already unemployed, you want the government to lay off government workers or stop or reduce their spending, whether it be over here or over there? You want them to be required to do that? That will be more unemployment, more people looking for jobs but without them. Because of that situation, economists are generally opposed to a balanced budget amendment for the United States federal government. And I know, I know that that was uh, informative and interesting for you. I know you never thought about those things. And if you heard them, you would have said, that sounds great. But now that you've dove into them, you say, I see some of the trade-offs, which is what we're about here. So I hope that that uh, is fulfilling as I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it is. And uh, when we come back in the next segment, we're really going to get into some mechanical things and yes, back to the models and the graphs related to uh, fiscal policy.